artist, author, inventor, and president of the largest diving company in Canada, Phil Newton has perhaps changed forever the way man will explore the deep ocean. Phil, what, what exactly is that? Well, this is a, uh, a mask in the Northwest Indian coast style. This one's going to be an octopus. So that's what these tentacles are here. This is the, of course, the eyes. And it's kind of an unusual one. You don't very often see it depicted this way because the, the underside of the octopus, its mantle, is thrown back around the face. You see here, and what'll be here, which will be kind of jazzy, will be a, a copper beak. So it'll be a giant copper beak, actually much larger than it would be in scale. And then there'll be copper insets in the eyes. So this will be hollowed out in the back and will be worn um, with an outfit kind of similar to this. There's a, there'll be a, a dance cape, which will have tentacles on it also. And uh, this is what the mask will look like. Very un-Indian of me uh, to make drawings of it beforehand. But, you know, sometimes I sit at Can Dive and, uh, and think about submarines and all that sort of stuff. And in the midst of all the submarines and everything else, this sort of a thought for a mask or a totem pole or something comes drifting through, and so I sketch it out. I wanted to, to capture the, the essence of the sea creature, which were depicted on the on the totem poles and on the mask. And so I went to the Vancouver Public Aquarium. At that time, it was an old aquarium that was uh, right on the waterfront. It had open tanks. And you could look into these tanks and hear the sea anemones and, oh gosh, the hydra sponges and corals and everything. And I took one look in that tank and thought, my God, that's incredible. I want to go down there and see how it really looks. At any rate, I did get to go diving. And I, as soon as I looked underwater, that was it. I determined at that time, although I love the Indian art, I've never given it up. I determined that what I wanted to do with my life was explore under the sea. Well, there's reason to believe that, and uh, you have uh, one of the greatest collections of old diving equipment that I've ever seen in my life. And among that collection, you said that you have the first diving apparatus that you've ever, you ever used, you made yourself. Yeah, it was a uh, oxygen rebreather. Uh, way before the, um, the advent of uh, the aqualung, or the scuba gear as we know it now, there was a type of system which is not unsimilar to an astronaut's breathing backpack, it's called a rebreather. And they're fairly simple to build, and I built one when I was 12 years old, and actually dove it and tested it, and it worked, and I used it many, many times. I'd be glad to show it to you if you'd like. You, you have it yeah, here? Yeah, I have it here. Let's have a look at it. This is uh, the rig I was telling you about. This is an oxygen rebreather, and it's a, even now, I mean, I built this when I was, gosh, I don't know, 12, maybe 13, but probably about 12, and it's still plenty functional today. This is uh, the part, you know, you put your mouth and breathe through. Oxygen in this bottle, a CO2 absorbent in this tube in here that you breathe back and forth through, and a breathing bag. And you wear this rig, and uh, there are no bubbles. It's like the uh, World War II frogmen uh, used in shallow water. And the reason that I built this was because when I took up uh, snorkel diving, skin diving, you couldn't stay long enough. You couldn't go deep enough. You couldn't see what was there. And it's so tantalizing to go, you know, you want to see what's beyond the next rock and over the next hill. So I built this piece of breathing apparatus to try and do that. And that's why you see all this, this breathing apparatus, life support equipment, because I was fascinated with it. I mean, it was really important to me. And these are, these are fiberglass helmets that uh, were type that came after the, the hard hat. We built a lot of them right here. This is the old, old uh, standard gear, hard hat, heavy gear. They still use a lot of this today. And, and what's that over here, Phil? This is a uh, pressure hull, or half of a pressure hull, from a, a U.S. Navy submarine called the Moray. This was built by the U.S. Navy about, uh, oh gosh, about 20 odd years ago. And it was designed as a deep diving, high speed submersible. So it had three of these pressure hulls. And these were built uh, to withstand a depth of about 2,000 meters, about 6,000 feet. But in those days, very little was known about cast aluminum for pressure hulls. So they built it way, way overkill. And this is huge. So I believe this can be rated for about 10,000 feet. So my plan is to take this half, add an acrylic, a plexiglass hemisphere to it, and make a 6,000 foot submersible. But you have submarines everywhere. There's a submarine in there. There's yeah, that's there's right. That's, uh, that's sea, sea Otter, the first sub we built here. There's even a submarine in this box. This is uh, Sea Urchin going out to Techno. I'll tell you what, you want to see a submarine that you wear, a yes. personal submarine? Come look at this. So, that's the Nutsu. That's, that's a submarine that you wear. But Phil, I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, but these kind of suits have been around for, 
For a long time, haven't they? Oh, yeah. Well, the idea has been around for a long time. These kind of suits haven't been around for a long time. But what makes this different than, than the suits that have been? Well, the way these joints work, you see, this is a rotary bearing. It just rotates. So the trick is to get this motion, this flexion extension motion, hinge motion, by rotation. So these are just turning in circles, but you're actually getting, you know, a hinge motion. In the past, what they tried to do was take deals like this, like a concertina, and make them work this way to, to give a flexion motion, but they're very limited. The amount that you can move is very, very small, just a slight bit. So what happens is that the arms then can only move just very slightly, and that won't do it. This was a, uh, an attempt to get a real hinge motion. This actually originated in France in 1882. Two brothers, the Carmagnol brothers, developed this in France, this design. A hundred years later, this was used for a spacesuit design. And it's never been used underwater yet, but it's, it might one day. And this is very stiff, but the idea is there, but always this concertina. So the, the sort of breakthrough of the newt suit is to use ordinary rotation to get this motion. How, how deep can you go with the, with the joints? I mean, how deep can the suit go? Well, the suit goes, this one is rated for 1,000 feet, uh, about 325 meters, but the joints themselves are not depth sensitive. That is, they can go much, much deeper. By making them slightly heavier, they can go, gosh, to the, to the bottom of the ocean because they don't really know where they are. We fool them into not knowing uh, what, what they're seeing. The pressure balances them. We've actually tested uh, the torsos, the castings, well over 3,000 feet. Well, th there's one right there with a, with a huge hole in it. So. <laughs> That's one of the ones that was tested. This was actually run down in a pressure chamber to depths uh, about four times the, the working depth before it collapsed. And this was an early design based on, on what happened to this one. We've since beefed up, beefed up that area. So this suit, although it's rated for 1,000 feet, would probably go to 5,000 or so feet before it collapsed. A tremendous safety factor. To work 12 hours at 1,000 feet with conventional divers requires 10 days and over 50 tons of support material, 24 hours to compress, 12 hours of work, and eight days of decompression. In this suit, the same dive would take 12 hours, as there is no compression or decompression, and it would require only two tons of support material. You've added uh, these propellers to, oh, the, yeah. to the suit, and how does that... Well, uh, you know, why walk when you can fly? It's, it's that simple. The, this thruster pack is very similar to the manned maneuvering unit used out of the space shuttle. The way it operates is, is similar, and it has, it's a cruciform thruster, that is, it has a propeller on top, so you have vertical control and horizontal control. The operator controls this with foot pedals, and they're very ingenious. Inside, there's a foot pad, and when he presses forward, he goes forward. When he presses back with his heel, he goes backwards. And the other foot, if he presses forward, he goes down, and backwards, he goes up. So you can actually control both of them, just like driving a car. The atmospheric diving suit is such an obvious solution. The problem with the existing models is they didn't work well. They didn't have that final amount of dexterity. They could move this much, they needed to move this much. And so I set about to find a way to make them do that. The joints that you've seen here are patented worldwide. They work extremely well. I honestly believe that this uh, might well be a milestone in diving history. I think that you'll see a generic shift in the next half decade or so over to this type of diving. Phil, there's one thing that impresses me about this suit, and that's that it's the most aesthetic piece of underwater gear that I've ever seen. 
And I think that it's this combination of your knowledge as an engineer and your talents as an artist that made this suit possible. And perhaps the reason why none of this was done before was it needed that kind of combination of art and engineering. What do you think about it? Uh, you, you could be right. I, I don't know if that's exactly correct, but the suit needed to look this way. It, it wanted to be born in this shape. And I know that sounds terribly artistic and everything. I don't mean it that way, but I, I guess I mean that when something functions well, it has a certain look to it, a certain functional aesthetic look. And you see it in other things, not certainly just in these suits. You see it in aircraft, you see it in everything. When you look at something and it, it talks to you, not just of its function, of its engineering, but a sort of a, a, a look of beauty, of aesthetics, of art to it, combined those two. You know, I think this is the way the suit needed to look. 